the person and you said the right thing, you said it in the right way, but you came out and you actually said it to the wrong person. Maybe it was something like a customer service 800 number type of thing. We've all had to ask for the manager at some point. But sometimes it's that we said the right thing to the right person in the right way, but we absolutely dropped the ball when it came to timing. You know, if we've ever had a conflict in our life, we know it's a real struggle to renew the relationship and reconcile. But if we do want to renew relationships, which is our focus for the month of, this is August, if we do want to reconcile with our brothers and sisters in Christ, if we do want to reconcile with our neighbors, if we do want to reconcile with those that we may have conflicts, conflicts with, we need to learn how to say the right thing in the right way, at the right time, to the right person. And that's what we see Paul doing in the book of Philippians. To be honest, as Paul is writing this book, he is walking into a very delicate situation. He's writing to Philemon, a master. He's writing to Philemon, who lives in Colossae, while knowing that Onesimus is Philemon's runaway slave. And Paul writes this letter to Philemon from Rome. And so he writes this letter to a master, mentioning this master's runaway slave in a faraway city. So there's automatically a conflict here in the book of Philemon. What will happen with Onesimus? And so Paul has to walk a very tight road. Because under Roman law, it was not uncommon for masters to have the right, to have the ability to kill their slaves, to execute their slaves for any crime. And so Onesimus, under Roman law at least, could have been executed. So Paul's writing a very, very, very tight rope here. But instead of saving Onesimus' life, he has something else in, in mind in part. He has reconciliation in mind. Here in the book of Philemon, we see that Paul is paving the road to reconciliation between slave and master. Onesimus and Colossae, or Philemon and Colossae, and Onesimus there in Rome with Paul. The book of Philemon is a powerful letter, like we said a moment ago, but it's full of practical wisdom showing us how to resolve conflicts, showing us how to renew relationships, showing us how to pave the road to reconciliation. It's a letter that shows us that reconciliation requires love, wisdom, and the gospel. I think those are three practices, three things we can put into practice in our own relationships here on earth as we seek to renew those relationships. When you go to meet in Philemon chapter 1, which is only one chapter, so the only chapter there in Philemon, beginning in verse 1, where Paul writes, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Athia, our sister, and to Archicodus, our fellow soldier, to the church that meets in your home. That's Philemon's home. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always, Paul says, thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. The first thing we see Paul doing here in Philemon is he is reconciling with love. And that's in Philemon's 1, 1 through 7. I'm sorry for the graphic. It gets squished in transition sometimes. Paul knows, as we've talked about already, he is walking into a minefield. And so he must tread carefully. After all, as we've said already, Onesimus is a runaway slave. And Paul is building up to a big request. And as Paul there in the text describes Philemon's love in the faith and his participation in the faith, and the joy and encouragement that he has gotten from Philemon, Paul concludes that 
section by talking about, I've been praying for you. It says, Philemon, while you've been in Colossae, 1,100 miles away, I am praying for you. I don't know about you, but those are some of the most encouraging words in the English language. I have a preacher friend back in Tennessee. He's become a little bit of a mentor for me in the last year or so. And we talk periodically, whether it's Zoom, whether it's phone, whether it's text. And one of the things we'll do periodically is shoot me a text message and say, Hey, man, I've been praying for you. Work there in love. Or he'll start off a call and say, Man, how's it going there in love? Man, I've been praying for you. How's it going there? How's the church doing there? I don't know about you, but every time he says it, it feels like the monkey that's on my back, the load that's on my shoulders is lifted up, and I feel encouraged. So it's not hard for me to grasp. It's not hard for me to think that maybe, just maybe, Philemon would have saw those words there in the text in verse 4 and in verse five, uh, 6 where Paul says, I am praying for you, Philemon. And guess what? Philemon may have been encouraged too. But that's not all. See, as Paul begins his letter here, one of the things that jumps out to me is Philemon's heart. And the fellowship they shared in Jesus Christ and Philemon's love for all the saints. In fact, there in the text, he mentions Philemon's love two times there in the text. Paul is pouring on. He is talking. He is raving about Philemon's love. Why in the world would Paul start his letter by raving about Philemon's love? Because Paul knows that love can reach where logic not. And so Paul pours it on. He is doing everything he can to pull on Philemon's heartstrings. After all, Philemon's name meant more or less the loving one. And so what Paul is telling Philemon here in the text is, hey Philemon, I know you've shown love. Continue to show up love. But live up to your name that means the loving one. But the love that Philemon shows here in the book of Philemon is not just an emotional love. Like you may say to your dog, I love you, dog. Which I know all of us love our pets. The love here of Philemon is real. It's active. It's practical. It lives itself out. That's the kind of love that leads to reconciliation. That's the kind of love that leads to renewing relationships. After all, as brothers and sisters in Christ, love binds us together. Love for one another moves us to action. Love renews our relationships. Love reconciles. And so if we are going to renew our relationships as a church family, if we're going to renew relationships with our friends and our family members, if we're going to renew relationships with maybe people we don't get along with, then we need to love them. Because love paves the road to reconciliation. And spoiler alert, we're going to be talking more about love next month. That's our focus for the month of September. We'll talk more about that then. But love plays a critical role in reconciliation. But I want to ask us this question. That if Paul was writing a letter to me, if he was writing a letter to Austin today, or fill in your name there. Would he be able to write these words about me? Would he be able to say, hey, Austin, I hear you're a source of joy. I hear you're a source of encouragement. I hear you're a source of love and refreshment to the body of Christ. Paul could say that about Philemon because Philemon was a loving man. He loved all the saints. He served all the saints. He refreshed all the saints. And so as Paul sets the stage to reconcile slave and master, he sets the stage by talking about Philemon's love. Because love is the foundation of all reconciliation. But Paul goes on there in verse 8, where Paul writes these words in verse 8, where it says, For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you. Instead, on the basis of love, I, Paul, as an elderly man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you 
For my son Onesimus, I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. I am sending him back to you. I am sending my very own heart. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed may not be out of obligation, but out of your own free will. The second thing I think we see here in Philippians 1 is that we need to reconcile with wisdom there in verses 8 through 14. What's really interesting to me here in Philemon is Paul doesn't pull rank. Paul's an apostle. He could have told Philemon, hey, Philemon, I'm an apostle. I got rank. Give me Onesimus. But Paul doesn't. Paul doesn't pull rank. And I think there's a very important application for us from this principle. That effective reconciliation doesn't pull rank. It doesn't say, I'm an elder, I'm a preacher, I'm a deacon, I'm a Bible class teacher. I'm your boss at work. And so therefore, you will reconcile with this person. That's not what Paul does here in this text. Instead, Paul lays the groundwork through wisdom. You see, effective reconciliation uses wisdom to know the best path forward to achieving reconciliation. So what Paul has done up until this point is he's spent a truckload of the first half of the book complimenting Philemon. He's talked about in verses 1 through 7, his love, his faith, his service. He's talked about their fellowship in the gospel. And he doesn't even mention Onesimus until halfway through the letter in verse 10. Philemon's only 25 verses long, and it's verse 10 when we see Onesimus for the first time. Why does Paul wait 10 verses to mention Onesimus' name? Why does Paul spend the first half of the letter raving about Philemon? Because Paul knows that effective reconciliation requires truth, requires tact, And it requires time. And Paul, here in the text, uses all three. That's the wisdom. Paul shows tact there in Philemon 1 by spending the first half of the book complimenting Philemon. He shows timing by waiting halfway through the book before mentioning Onesimus' name. And when Onesimus is mentioned, we'll see in just a second, the focus is not on his place as a slave, focuses on his transformation of the gospel. In the fact that both slave and master, Onesimus and Philemon, are both reconciled permanently, verse 15 tells us, by the gospel and the hope it brings. And so when Paul does make his appeal here in a second, his formal appeal, he appeals on the basis of Not just Philemon's love for his brothers and sisters in Christ, but also for Paul's love for Philemon. And even that's done there with wisdom there in verse 11. That Onesimus was once useless to you, Paul says, but he's useful to both of us. I am sending him back. I am sending, Paul says, my very own heart. Paul's heart is being poured out on this page. And so as Paul sends Onesimus back, probably with the letter here that bears Philemon's name, he's sending him back not as a runaway slave, but as a useful servant in the kingdom of God. And as Paul makes his appeal there for Onesimus, he goes, oh, by the way, Philemon, I could really, really use Onesimus right now. It's almost like Paul is writing from the prison going, Philemon, while you live in your mansion surrounded by servants, I, Paul, an old man, I'm in chains. I'm in a dark, dungy prison cell. And Onesimus could be a great encouragement to me. So if you could please send him back, it would really, really encourage me. 
So as Paul makes his appeal there in the text, that very emotional appeal, that appeal done out of wisdom, Paul knows that the ball is not in his court. It's in Philemon's. Paul knows that slave and master, Onesimus and Philemon, need to be reconciled themselves before Paul could be reconciled with Onesimus. So Onesimus could come back and play a role in Paul's missionary journeys. So here in Philemon, Paul appeals to Philemon to make the right choice for the right reasons there in the text. What Paul is doing here in Philemon is really giving us a master class. A master class in dealing with our own relational issues. That the road to reconciliation is, yes, it's paved with love, but it's bound together with wisdom. Paul shows us that effective really reconciliation takes the time to think about where people are at that point in time. How they may perceive the conflict, how they may perceive you, and uses that information to seek reconciliation. It also tells us that we're not all the same. In fact, we're all different in that we need to be approached differently. And so whether we are seeking physical or spiritual reconciliation, this means we don't need to approach all Christians the same way. Some Christians need to be snatched from the fire. Other Christians, other brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling don't need to be snatched. They just need to be gently pulled and pushed to leave the fire of temptation. And knowing the difference between the two requires wisdom. You know, one of the best examples of this is a eldership of a church back east. I won't say the state because that would narrow it down significantly, especially for those who may know me. But these, this eldership was fantastic at this. That when they could see kids, and there happened to be a college in that town, college kids struggling in their faith. They would usually go to another college kid or two and say, hey, we've noticed Bob over here. I don't think there's a Bob here today, so I can use that name. We've noticed Bob. He's struggling. He hasn't been coming on Sunday nights. He hasn't been coming on Wednesday nights. Could you check on Bob? And so the kids would start by checking on Bob and encouraging and gently encouraging Bob. And then they would follow it up a couple weeks later with one of the elders visiting with Bob. And when they visited with Bob, they wouldn't accuse Bob of anything. They would just gently talk to him and show love and pour on love. They exercised wisdom. They used the best person, the elder, that individual, that kid Bob was closest to, to reconcile that college kid, that struggling college kid, with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I marvel at that wisdom. They use wisdom to reconcile each person because they realize that reconciliation requires wisdom. At the same time, though, we cannot force reconciliation. Whether it's physical or spiritual reconciliation, we can't force it. We can encourage, but we cannot force. And knowing the difference between the two of those requires wisdom. And that's what we see from Paul in the text. Paul does not force Philemon, the best I can tell in the book of Philemon at least, Paul does not force Philemon to reconcile. But he very, very strongly, gently encourages it. He uses the right words at the right time to the right person in his attempt to reconcile Philemon and Onesimus. That's wisdom. And reconciliation requires wisdom. But there's one more thing we see from the text there in verse 15, and that begins where Paul there it says there in the text, For perhaps this is why he, that's Onesimus, was separated from you for a brief time, so that you might get him back permanently. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He's especially so to me, and how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay. Not to mention you owe me even your very self. 
Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Meanwhile, prepare a guest room for me. Since I hope through your prayers, I know I've been praying for you. Paul says, now I hope you've been praying for me. I will be restored to you. The third thing we see here in the text is that we can reconcile through the gospel. Paul has appealed to this point in Philemon with love, wisdom, and now encourages Philemon to reconcile based on the gospel. That because of the gospel, Onesimus is no longer just a slave. He's a brother in Christ. Because of the gospel, Onesimus has returned to flee. Onesimus has traveled 1,100 miles back from Rome. Either walking 1,100 miles or taking a very, very dangerous ship ride from Rome to Colossae. To reconcile with his master. And now Paul bring, or Onesimus brings back a letter from Paul asking Philemon to re, uh, welcome Onesimus back. After all, Onesimus and Philemon have both been reconciled to God through the blood of Christ. They've both been slay, saved by the death and resurrection of Christ. That even though Onesimus is a slave and Philemon is his master, they are united. Permanently, verse 15 says, by the blood of Christ. What Paul is telling Philemon, and what we need to realize, is that our relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ supersedes any physical differences we may have. It supersedes our differences based on race. It supersedes our differences based on socioeconomic class. It supersedes any difference we may have in this life. That's what reconciliation is. That it makes people who were apart because of class, people who were apart maybe because of race, they bring them together and they become one. They are united. But Paul's request there in the text goes one step further. And this kind of takes us back to verse 13 and 14, where Paul says, I wanted to keep him with me. I like him. I could use him around. He could be a great encouragement. But I didn't want to do so without your consent. Paul is telling Philemon there in the text, don't just welcome Onesimus back. Give him a hug and send him back out the door. Go by in the southwest flight back to Rome. Philemon here in the book of his, that bears his name has the power to transform Onesimus from a household servant to a kingdom servant. And this is the request that Paul has been building up to. The entire letter seems to be building up to that one single request. That even though Onesimus is a runaway slave, even though Onesimus is a young believer at this time, Paul sees potential in this young believer. And he says, Philemon, I could really use Onesimus. He could be a useful tool in the kingdom. Would you please, three please with a cherry on top, let me use Onesimus to advance the kingdom of God. The gospel transformed Onesimus from a runaway slave into a servant of the kingdom. And here's what's really cool for me. History tells us that about this time, or a little after this time period, there was an elder in the church of Ephesus. An elder in the church of Ephesus, which is not too terribly far away from Colossae, whose name was Onesimus. And based on the timing, it seems likely, even probable, that Onesimus was freed, allowed to return to Paul, and somehow, someway, ended up back in Ephesus, serving as an elder for that church. That's what the gospel does. That's what the gospel did to Onesimus, and that's what the gospel can do for us. Because we were all runaways. We were all aliens. We were all strangers and separated from our master and our king. And yes, it reconciled us to our God. 
It transformed us from useless instruments to useful servants in the kingdom. So part of gospel reconciliation is recognizing that we all have a part to play in the kingdom, that we are all useful in the kingdom of God. And so when I look at that young disciple of Christ, whether it's young in spiritual maturity or young in age, do I see them as a useful tool in the kingdom? You know, so often we may hear that phrase, they are the church of tomorrow. Folks, they're the church of today. They may be the elders and deacons and preachers in decades to come, but they are the church of today. Because young disciples, we're saved by the same blood of Christ that we were. Young disciples were reconciled to God through the blood of Christ just like we are. And they are useful in the kingdom today. But when I look at someone who's from a different socioeconomic background, someone who's poor, maybe someone who's rich, someone who's black, maybe someone who's white, maybe someone who's Hispanic, maybe they're from whatever country, whatever race, do I see them as useful to the kingdom of God. Guys, usefulness in our, the kingdom of God is not tied to social economic class. It's not tied to being white. It's not tied to being black. It's not tied to being rich. It's not tied to being poor. Everyone can be useful in the kingdom of God. One of the things we need to realize as disciples of Christ is that the ground is level at the that whether we are white or black, whether we are rich or poor, whether we are slave or free, we all stand side by side at the foot of our, the cross, praising our Savior. And that even though Onesimus is a slave and Philemon is a master, there is no reason, Paul says as he concludes that letter, not to reconcile. Paul goes on there in verse 18 and says, look, if there's anything, I'm paraphrasing here, anything hindering you guys from reconciling, charge it to my account. I'll foot the bill. Oh, he says there, and don't forget, verse 19, you owe me your very self. So let's just call it even, Paul says. And he concludes his letter by telling Philemon, you know what, I'm on my way, but guess what, I know you're going to do more. I know you're going to do more than what I ask. Now imagine for a second that you're Philemon. And Onesimus arrives back there in Colossae, in the church that meets in your home, and he arrives back with two letters. <coughs> One, the Colossian letter, and two, the letter that bears your name, that's addressed specifically to you. And the Colossian letter is read before the church and everybody yells a hearty amen, thankful that Paul wrote them a letter. And then they read that letter to Philemon. And the entire church looks at you and says, what are you going to do? Are you going to reconcile with Onesimus? And imagine for a second Onesimus is there in the room. Wondering what's going to happen. Will he be executed? Will he be reconciled? Will he be sent back to Paul? How does he feel in that moment? And in that moment when Philemon says, I'll reconcile. I'll forgive. And Onesimus, why don't you just go ahead and get on a boat and go back to Paul there in Rome. How did Onesimus feel? How did Philemon feel there in that moment when they were reconciled? When they were made one again, all because of the gospel. No. That all because of the gospel, Philemon, or Onesimus goes from slave of Philemon to servant of God. He goes from a runaway slave to a reconciled, saved individual thanks to the gospel of Christ. Guys, that's what the gospel has the power to do. If we hope to reconcile, we have to reconcile based on love, on wisdom in the gospel. That's the message that is reconciled for 2,000 years. And if you're a sinner tonight, you've been separated from your Savior, you've been separated from your King, you've been separated from your Master. 
you can be reconciled to God. The same way Onesimus was. The same way Philemon was. The same way Paul was. The same way all of us are. The gospel of Christ. That Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, shed His blood, was raised on the third day, and now reigns in heaven as King of all creation. That's the message that saves your soul. And all this king, all our king asks is for us to obey him. To give our lives over in service to him. Submitting to him in every way. If you would like to submit to Jesus as your Savior, please let us know while together we sing.